This is KGW News at 11. We start with big news from Oregon health officials. If you are 16 and older and want a COVID-19 vaccine, you will be eligible starting May 1st. Thank you for joining us. I'm Laurel Porter. That makes all adults eligible two months ahead of schedule. But it has the groups who were already scheduled to be eligible in May worried about competing for an appointment. Catherine Cook reports. They've been essential workers during the entire pandemic, stocking food, working checkout lines, exposed to thousands of people every day. So when Oregon grocery workers learned they'd be eligible for the vaccine May 1st, it was a sigh of relief and one they felt was long overdue. We've been pressuring the governor, asking the governor, pleading the governor to please move us forward in priority and be it based off the CDC recommendations. Miles Ashaya is with Local 555, Oregon's grocery store union. On Wednesday, he and the union's 19,000 members learned that now every adult in Oregon would also be eligible for the vaccine May 1st. The announcement came from the Oregon Health Authority. It lines up with President Biden's order. Last week, he said all American adults must be vaccine eligible by May 1st, saying there would be enough doses. Ashaya says that's of little comfort to grocery workers. They have to compete to get an appointment. Um, that's that's the challenge. It's it's competition with the entire state of Oregon. Like just, oh, by the way, you get to be vaccinated with everyone else. It's just it's I don't want to say slap in the face. because That's a cliche, but it's um, it's very unfortunate. Grocery store workers in Washington don't have to wait until May 1st for their vaccine. They became eligible on Wednesday. We're happy. Howard Ross works at a Fred Meyer store in Vancouver. The pandemic has been on his mind every day. It can be kind of scary because you don't know who has it and the things that you hear and you don't want to take it home to your family. But through it all, you have to do your job and everything. So you just stay positive and keep your head up. It's just our hope that the governor will come will work with us and you know create a path for prioritization for grocery workers. While Governor Brown hasn't shared plans to do that, the director of the Oregon Health Authority hinted at the possibility. We're exploring right now is the feasibility of moving up the eligibility of frontline workers and younger people with pre-existing conditions. We give access to that population before we move to the general population. Ashaya says, practically speaking, that just makes sense. And he believes it's the right thing to do. These are essential people. They're not disposable and they're being treated as such and it's not OK. Governor Brown's office tells me they are currently reevaluating Oregon's vaccine timelines and expect to have more information to share on Friday. They say the governor is committed to equitable vaccine distribution, and that includes for Oregon's frontline workers. Catherine Cook, KGW News. Those of you who haven't been eligible for the vaccine yet may be wondering how you sign up for an appointment. It is still not a straightforward answer, but we're trying to make it a little bit easier for you. We've compiled a list on KGW.com. You'll see a tab near the top of the page that says getting the vaccine. You can go there now and we'll walk you through how to secure an appointment, whether it's at a mass vaccination site like the Oregon Convention Center, a community clinic or a chain pharmacy. We also have a list of the times appointments open up at these sites so you know when to log on and try for a slot. That's all on KGW.com. It has been a long time since the Timbers Army and Rose City Riveters have been allowed inside Providence Park to cheer on the Timbers and the Thorns. But in a matter of weeks, that all changes. The state has released updated guidelines for outdoor events, meaning a limited number of fans will be welcomed at home matches. Mike Benner has the details. Fanless and eerily quiet Timbers and Thorns games will soon be a thing of the past. And the team's president of business, Mike Golub, couldn't be any happier. Really exciting day for us uh, and really for our fans who have just been uh, itching to come back. Come April, approximately 6,500 fans, that's 25% of Providence Park's capacity, will be allowed inside the stadium to cheer on the Timbers and Thorns. We are just so hungry to see our fans back. It's going to be a really 
momentous day. The elation comes in the wake of the Oregon Health Authority's announcement Wednesday. 50% occupancy will now be allowed at outdoor sporting and entertainment events in lower-risk counties. In the case of the Timbers and Thorns, 25% occupancy in moderate-risk counties, 15% occupancy in high-risk counties, and a max of 50 people in extreme-risk counties. We're just so excited that we're finally going to be able to see you after a really long and stressful year for everyone. Hopefully we can recreate some of those moments some magic and we're looking forward to all the energy you bring to all of our games fantastic news exciting to know that you guys can be back in the stadium with us we can't wait to see you feel your love feel your energy from the thorns head coach to a timber star player there's nothing better than the idea of playing in front of fans but who exactly Golub says the teams will first offer tickets to season ticket holders and they can expect to see covid safety protocols at providence park We're going to have staggered entrances and and certain paths um, through the stadium that are designated and up aisles and down aisles. And we're going to be completely cashless. Uh, we're going to have mobile ordering. Not to mention a number of other safety measures. All of it, Golub says, was planned with players, stadium staff, and fans in mind. We are fully confident um, that we are going to have a very safe, secure in environment. It's also worth mentioning the Hillsboro Hops will be able to fill their stadium to 25% capacity when their season starts in early May. Team president K.L. Wambacher saying the team couldn't be more thrilled. I also reached out to the Oregon School Activities Association. The executive director says these new capacity limits will impact outdoor high school events like football. To what extent, though, is unclear. OSAA is awaiting further direction from the Oregon Health Authority. I'm Mike Benner for KGW News. Go Timbers, go Thorns, go Hops. Well, new here at 11, Oregon State's president is now on probation through the beginning of June. The OSU Board of Trustees has been meeting all day to decide if F. King Alexander would keep his job. They decided on probation tonight and said during that time, Alexander has to come up with a concrete plan to build community trust. Alexander came to Oregon State last summer. He faces claims he mishandled cases of sexual assault at his previous job at Louisiana State University. Reports by USA Today and a Missouri law firm accuse LSU of not doing enough to stop or investigate instances of sexual misconduct. That includes those involving LSU's then football coach, Les Miles. More than 100 people submitted written testimony today. 19 others spoke in the trustee meeting. Survivors are here at this university to learn, not to educate you or people who abuse us or bodies like you that uphold the systems that protect those abusers. We demand you finally take action as if it is your own daughters attending this university. The consensus was Oregon State should have known about the investigation into LSU and shouldn't have hired oh, Alexander do. in the first place. Alexander did get an opportunity to speak and had this message for survivors of sexual abuse. I am truly sorry here for survivors and everywhere for any pain caused to you by this issue that has surfaced in the last couple of weeks. I also feel terribly for anyone who has experienced sexual assault, violence, harassment, which I am committed to eradicating from our community and society. It simply has no place here or anywhere. The Board of Trustees also decided tonight to hire an outside consultant to help the university come up with ways to bolster programs aimed at combating sexual assault. Tonight, Portland City Commissioner Joanne Hardesty is responding to the abrupt resignation of the police union president. It was apparently related to false accusations made against the commissioner. Dan Haggerty has the update. So here's the explanation the union gave us. They said, we learned that Portland Police Association president Brian Hunsaker made a serious isolated mistake related to the police bureau's investigation into the alleged hit and run by Commissioner Joanne Hardesty, though they didn't explain what that quote mistake was. Now, I know you remember this story. Earlier this month, Commissioner Hardesty was falsely named in a police report about a hit and run by the driver of the car that was hit, but it turns out it was not Hardesty involved in this crash, and police completely cleared her of any involvement shortly after, but not before right-wing Facebook groups somehow got their hands on the police report and started spreading that misinformation online. So today, we reached out to Hardesty to see if she had anything to say about the union president quitting. 
She told us that she really doesn't know anything about the whole situation other than what we've reported, but we did ask her what she wants to see happen now that Hunsinger has resigned. Um, I hope that the due diligence, the investigation actually uncovers what the mistake was and that we, the public and myself included, get to know specifically what he did and why he did it and then be held accountable for his behavior. The mayor, who also serves as police commissioner, says he hasn't been told what serious mistake Hunsinger made either. In fact, he actually, at this point, is demanding to know what Hunsinger did. We can speculate, of course, and a lot of people are speculating online, but uh, I think we should probably choose to do otherwise, considering that would just fuel more misinformation. So as of right now, we're only going to tell you what we know. and We're going to keep asking questions until we can find out more, and then we will bring you those answers. The Portland City Council heard public testimony today on a proposal to allow homeless shelters and organized camps in more places around the city. The council is considering eliminating zoning restrictions, allowing agencies to open shelters faster without public comment and in parks or open spaces. The council today heard from those adamantly against the idea and those who passionately support it. We need to set some sort of standards. This is completely out of control. I beg you, please clean up the camps. Our city used to be beautiful. I cannot drive more than 30 minutes through my city without seeing it being treated like a dump. Put yourself in the shoes of a houseless neighbor. What would it mean to you to have a safe place to sleep, secure your belongings, a place with access to hygiene and cooking facilities, and a place where you can make and find community and support? They also heard from some who don't have to imagine what it's like to be houseless. One woman begged for more options like tiny homes. She's been struggling to find a shelter where she feels safe. I'm out in the cold, I'm sick, I have nowhere to go. And I'm asking the man, goodness, mercy, to please to help us. The council will continue to discuss the issue at the next two weekly meetings and may vote by the end of the month. If you want to weigh in, you can submit written testimony online. You can find a link on Mayor Wheeler's website.